So the world of investing can often be a confusing place, with so many options seemingly contradicting themselves, a lot of noise on what you should and shouldn't do. That's before you even got into what are OICs, ETFs, investment trusts, OCFs, TR, it's not surprising most people are CBA. But having a grasp of the general concepts of your investment is a really big part of understanding what to expect and ultimately helping make sure you make better decisions. In this video, I'm gonna have a brief look in what you need to know about understanding your investments. Hi there, my name is George Agan and I'm a Chartered Financial Planner. And today I'm gonna to go over the brief overview of the main things you need to know about your investments. So why bother investing in the first place? Well, it's because across the spectrum of time, we've got two battles that are going on. Loss of purchasing power, battling permanent loss risk. We're gonna be investing at the end of the day, so we're using our future consumption or potentially even legacy, but we're trying to take advantage of the progression of society so that we can be better off at a later point. As my last video, Managing Inflation, showed, the problem with keeping things in savings is that your loss comes from inflation normally, or it certainly does in this economic environment. There's an expectation that over the long run, assuming you diversify well, the higher level of risk, generally the higher return you would expect. However, the best thing to think about it is the way that you are paid for the uncertainty. So the outcome clearly isn't guaranteed, and it's best going in understanding that there may be periods of changes in value to the investment. But that isn't necessarily something to be terrified about. We're gonna provide you a general overview of the things that you need to understand. So that is asset allocation, what that means, the idea behind the efficient frontier, and why that matters, diversification, why that's important, risk levels, what to expect, and then investment structures and what to be aware of. So asset classes. So the main asset classes I'll cover in this video are the general concepts behind equities, bonds, property and alternatives. So why have different asset classes? Well, the idea is that they'll offer something else to a portfolio as far as correlation. And that means that they generally won't move in tandem with each other. And the general concept is that if they don't move in tandem, they should hopefully perform more consistently across various economic environments. So let's have a look at shares or equities. There are various share types you can get, but I'll do a deep dive into this stuff if you want another time and you know, comment in the video and let me know if you do. But if we just assume normal ordinary shares, you own a share of a company, normally receive a voting right and you partake in the growth of the company and potentially get a dividend. You're an owner, not a loaner. So you take a higher level of risk purely compared to a bondholder on the basis that ordinary shareholders sit behind bondholders in priority in the event the company was to be liquidated and also for company payment order when balancing the books. So the equity premium is one of the more entrenched views in finance, which is that equities over the long term outperform, and for good reason. It has theoretical basis, I've just mentioned. It's also been verified empirically, so history being our guide, over the long run, equities have performed better. Using the figures from Credit Suisse's Global Returns yearbook, looking at period of the world from a world index from 1900 to 2019, equity real returns were 5.2, where the bonds were 2.0. It should, however, be noted, which is interesting, that from the period from 2000 to 2019, bonds outperformed equity, delivering 4.8 compared to 3.1. This is a time reminder that asset classes can have periods of over or underperformance depending on the economic environment. For bonds, we've been in the great bond bull run due to the period of long falling interest rates. I would argue this is more a byproduct of a changing economic environment than something you would expect on theory. Dividends and company profits are not guaranteed, and as we've seen in 2020 with a lot of companies deciding to cancel the dividends. However, the general theory is a company being able to reinvest their own profits well is you know, one of the key reasons why companies grow in value. So bonds. So the simple way to think about bonds is that IOUs from corporations or governments. This asset class is also called fixed interest. So the technical definition is that they're negotiable, fixed interest, long-term debt instruments. They're negotiable, as after buying the bond, the lender can sell it on via the secondary market. Fixed interest, as the borrower who lends it to you pays a fixed level of interest. Long term, as they normally issue between five and 30 years, so the short ones are available. And they're a debt instrument. They're a financial instrument representing debt. So credit quality is important with this in exactly the same way that you get better credit as a person if you've got a good credit rating and we're more likely to pay back. Generally, the lower the credit quality, the higher the coupon or the interest you'd expect. With that in mind, government bonds are considered the safest asset as effectively depending on the country. They may even be able to print their own currency, so theoretically could never go insolvent. That's why government bonds are used as the floor often when calculating the risk-free rate in asset pricing. However, as I'm sure you appreciate, not all governments are considered to have the stability, the same stability for global investors. The US has a reserve currency status, which means that they're currently the dominant currency for trade in the world. Venezuela, not so much. 
Sorry, Venezuela, I shared it in the last video as well. So the ratings agencies have a big part to play in this assessment of credit and credit quality. Using standard and poor's, they effectively call anything under the credit quality of triple B as junk. And a change in the credit quality can have an impact there because it can have a big impact on, for example, if pension funds can hold them because often they have quite strict requirements on the level of credit. You may also have a bond fund which has a mixture of credit quality. So bond prices would generally depend on a mixture of factors, inflation expectations, interest rates, duration of the bond, credit quality, market sentiment. Again, similar to that pricing analogy I gave you in my inflation video, the prevailing interest rate has a big difference to bond prices. If you have a bond payable at 5% interest rate for the next 10 years from a credit worthy lender, it's gonna be a lot more valuable if everything else in the market at the same rate is say 1%. The reasons why bonds has done well over the last 30 years is in general, interest rates have been dropping as a long-term trend over that period. There's also been quite a low inflation environment, certainly post-financial crisis, which is also a favorable condition for bonds. As you can see in this illustration of bond yields, for government bonds in Japan, Germany, and the US, basically they're going down as a trend. The thing that you may have heard is about yields. Yield is the return you get from the bond, so the price and the yield moves in opposite direction. So the price goes up, yields go down, and vice versa. Let me show you through this example. So remember, a bond on the secondary market can be offered at different prices. So as you can see, if we start with £100 to a 3% coupon, the yield you get will depend on the price you pay. So if the price drops, the yield increases and the other way around. So remember, bonds get paid first in relation to companies as far as payment orders. So they're often seen as more secure and are used as an equity hedge or volatility handbrake in portfolio. The idea is that hopefully they won't move in tandem with equities or be correlated. One of the big narratives going around is that lower yields mean that bonds no longer offer a diversification benefit. And it's true to say that lower yields offset equity drawdowns less, as this example shows, with Germany and Japan's ability to offset equity drawdowns generally falling. The US holds up quite well, but I'd argue that might be because they're more of a reserve currency, and in bad times you tend to see a flight to safety. But while the fact that interest rates are lower and various other factors have led to more correlation between assets, there is still, certainly academically, a strong argument that bonds cushion the blow on market dips and act as a hedge against equities. As this graph shows how much the investments move in tandem against the 10-year US Treasury in the S&P 500. What's interesting in this argument is that the correlation until about 2000 was actually much higher. And after that, there was much more non-correlation, which is what you're looking for if you want it to act as a cushion. So property, we all know what property is. In the UK, we love a good buy to let. So quickly on residential property, I don't feel the need to go into this much depth. Most of us know the concept here. So residential buy to let is intuitive. One of the main advantages you have access to leverage potentially more cheaply than you would through other sources. For UK investors, you are however in a less favorable tax position compared to historic standards with the reduction of mortgage interest for tax purposes being brought down to a basic rate compared to it previously being fully tax deductible, as well as higher rates potentially for capital gains tax if it's applicable to your second home. This is gonna affect your yield and after tax and expenses, but ever it's incredibly specific in an area just to get advice or do your own figures on. Whether property offers something different commercial or residential just compared to a well-known series of risk factors is a topic for another video. But Lars Crozier makes a good point in his book, Investing Demystified, where he talks about diversification and property. And he says, if you work in an area, have a house in an area, and also purchase a buy to let in the same area, there's a lot of concentration risk, and I can't disagree with him. Generally speaking, the thing you have to be aware of is that any direct property investment, there's a potential for illiquidity, management and time intensive nature. Look, let's be honest, your equity portfolio doesn't call you at 3 a.m. because the water's gone. There's diversification options through property, through indirect options like REITs, which are closed end property funds or PAPs, they're open-ended versions, which have their own tax specifics. And I'll go into that structure and tax position on another video if you like for all you borings out there. The thing to be aware of is if you're looking to add property to your portfolio and you already have market cap weighted funds, Remember, if you have a fund which tracks a market cap weighted indice, such as the FTSE 100, you're not absent of a property allocation through this. Within the FTSE 100, there's already an allocation to REITs, and that's before we've truly gone under the hood and the argument that a lot of these companies actually hold commercial property as far as the book value. The benefits of property in a portfolio is a thing of debate. Some academic studies say they offer very little new apart from exposure to the same risk factors we know about through equities. Others make the case for a diversification benefit, but it's too big a topic. There's too many different opinions and it's something for another video if anyone's interested. So alternatives. Alternatives can cover commodities which are said to perform well generally in the late economic cycle to fine wine, art, gold, maybe even hedge funds. It's too broad a topic for me to go over but in really in any detail. All I can say is just make sure you know what you're doing. Fair question to start going in is, is it reasonable for this investment to have a positive expected return or is it just speculation? Do you really have a strong view on copper in Q2? 
So, the efficient frontier and risk. Okay, so when you sit down with a financial planner, the first thing they'll do is they'll really need to try and understand you as much as they can. What your goals are, what's important to you as a person. Once that's all done, there'll be a point and if you start discussing investment goals, they'll be likely to ask you to complete an attitude to risk questionnaire. Now, I'm not going to go into how useful these documents actually are, but the reason for this is they're trying to get a good starting point for you as a person, what your general attitude towards investment risk is, what your tolerances are for investment value changes, and then add these things together with things like your financial capacity, which means how much loss you can afford to take, as well as things like your time horizon, as if you needed money in, say, six months. There's no way we could justify investing in a really volatile investment as there'd be too much risk of the investment swings over the short time frame. So the general principle that investment processes follow are that of the efficient frontier. This stems from work from Nobel Prize winner Howie Markovich and modern portfolio theory. The efficient frontier describes the relationship between the return that you can get between expected from a portfolio and the risk as measured by standard deviation, which I'll explain in a second. The main inputs are the expected return from the portfolio, so that's pretty self-explanatory. The standard deviation, this is the dispersion of returns based on a set of values relative to its mean or its average. It's basically a measure of volatility of returns, how wild the swings are or aren't. The correlation, okay, so how much the investments move up or move down in tandem with each other. This is really key because a lot of portfolio theory is trying to have a mixture of non-correlated assets, so hopefully, and one drop of investment will be offset by the gain in another. The idea is that a portfolio that sits on the efficient frontier is the optimal level of return for the level of risk taken. And that right level of risk is a very specific thing, clearly, depending on an individual's goals and situation. Once you ideally know what risk is right for someone, you can then choose a portfolio which is generally done in line with the efficient frontier. You're trying to achieve the maximum level of return relative to the risk taken. It's worth noting you absolutely can invest off the curve, but the whole concept is that theoretically when you do that, the structure of your investment is suboptimal. You're basically investing with a higher level of risk for the investment, which is not expected to lead to a higher level of return. Now, critics of this theory saying that investments generally don't follow a standard distribution of returns, so it could be inaccurate. Either way, it remains a key framework in portfolio management. It's worth noting that people generally don't have one approach because money can be earmarked for various purposes, with various goals, time horizons, how much risk is acceptable. Going back to that example, the person who needed the money to cash to buy the house in six months may have significantly different approach to someone who was investing for a time in 30 years. So when I got to the end of this video, I realized it'd be far too long to be a single video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it up into two parters. The next part I'm going to release at the weekend, and then there'll be another video next Wednesday. This has been Principles Personal Finance. My name's George Agan, and if you did happen to like this video, if you could please like or share, it would be greatly appreciated as it helps the channel. See you next time. Thank you.